spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports. The man is incredible. The thrill of victory. The youngest champion. And the agony of defeat. Oh, yeah, look at him go! Oh, baby. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. Today at 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific, four of the world's greatest women golfers continue their quest for the title at the JCPenney LPGA Skins Game. And now the time has come. Live from the famous Brickyard, the greatest spectacle in auto racing, the Indianapolis 500. Next on ABC's Wide World of Sports. champion. Since 1911, the man who wins this race each year becomes a true hero of American sports. The Super Bowl hero. The Masters champion. The Indy 500 winner joins this elite group. For the driver who wins this event has won the biggest automobile race. He has the fastest car and has driven it better than anyone else. Victory at Indianapolis gives a driver all the stature of a World Series MVP. The winner of this race revels in the same glory as an American Olympic champion. They have all realized the supreme accomplishment in their sport. You just don't know what Indy means. <laughs> Today, 33 drivers will make the high-speed charge to Indy's checkered flag. One man will defeat all the rest. His story will be told a thousand times over. His name will appear in tomorrow's headlines. He will be famous and wealthy. And for the rest of his life, he will be known as a winner of the world's greatest race, the Indianapolis 500. Live from Indianapolis, ABC Sports proudly presents the drivers and teams of the Pep Boys Indy Racing League in the 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Well, there's an idea of what your view would look like if you were seated in the tower terrace, and there's the pit area at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. All the fans here now on their feet, uh, well, many of them at least are, because they anticipate, as do we, in less than a minute, we will rejoin the program leading up to the start of the engines. There's been a built-in hold, and now they are getting ready to once again trigger off the last of the ceremonies and run down to the start of the race. There is Menard's guys, Robbie Buell closest to you. Tony Stewart in his car sits on the inside of the second row. So Indianapolis, rain this morning, a delay, but we are ready to start the race and the forecast itself looks like we might be able to get the entire race in. Remember, it only takes 101 laps or just over half the distance to be a complete race. Let's go back to the public address. Race fans, thank you for your patience. It sounds like you're ready. It's time for that traditional singing of back home again in Indiana. Here's our good friend, Mr. Jim Neighbors. Traditional balloons are released behind the control tower.
Yes, all is ready. We've reached that time, certainly an emotional time for all of us. And here to give those famous words to start the 82nd running of this event is the chairman of the board of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mrs. Mary Hallman George. Gentlemen, start your engines. There's the command from Mary This main straightaway, the 11 rows of three, begin to start those engines to discover whether or not, in fact, they will fire despite the delay and the moisture in the air. The Indy Racing League did allow them to warm the engines uh, just about 40 minutes ago. Jerry Punch? Well, Paul, as the crews begin to migrate back toward their pits, this moment is truly electrifying. Now, keep in mind, the garage area opened at 3 o'clock this morning. These guys got wake-up calls at 2 a.m. They may already be physically and emotionally spent. Right now, they're running on adrenaline. Adrenaline, they hope, will last 500 miles. Jack? Jerry, when you get the command to start engines, the pavement actually vibrates with all of the horsepower. The crowd, well, they're only 30 yards away, 400,000 strong. But for the drivers, as they wait for the pace cars to pull away, the butterflies now are very big. They begin to narrow down their focus, look through the shield in their helmet, and try to stare down the long ribbon of pavement that's the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. These cars, methanol-powered as they are, can bring tears to your eyes. They're tears of joy, Paul Page, because Indy is about to begin. So the engines begin to warm here. We'll take a look at the starting field. In that front row, the Texas Connection, of course. A.J. Foyt's Houston-based team and Greg Ray of Plano, Texas. In the second row, Tony Stewart, his first Indy 500 that he hasn't been on the front row. In row number three, Scott Sharp with a new and untested engine as the field now is ready to pull away. In row four, Scott Goodyear, twice a runner-up, and Buddy Lazier, the 96 winner. The fifth row, there's J.J. Yaley. He's the youngest driver in the field at age 21. The sixth row, veterans from Indiana, Arizona, and Colorado. Row seven, now there's the sixth member of the Unzer family to qualify for the Indy 500. Eighth row, there are three rookies. Row nine is the fastest rookie in the field in the center there, Jimmy Kite and Jeff Ward, who finished third in last year's 500 and won Rookie of the Year honors. In the 10th row, the defending champion, Ari Leyendijk. And the 11th and final row at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The field has already begun to move. The fans, they are now very definitely on their feet. There is the alignment of the 11 rows of three. The safety crews come to the edge of the track and give a final thumbs up and wish these drivers Godspeed and wave them on their way. All nice and tight as the field does begin to pull away. And of course, Parnelli Jones in the driver of the pace car. But this is a little bit further ahead. Gary Gerald, he can see his antenna sticking up there. He's sitting on the passenger side. What has to be the thrill of a lifetime? Paul, I've been coming to this place for well over 25 years, and trust me, I've had great thrills here at Indianapolis, but nothing, nothing compares to this feeling at this moment. Astronaut David Wolf is my wheelman. We're onto the back straightaway in the Corvette. The speed is only 40 miles an hour. We'll soon be up to about 60, and then very shortly, the field will be up to over 200 miles per hour. I wish every motor sports fan could experience this moment. It's just impossible to comprehend hundreds of thousands of race fans. It's magic, Paul. It's absolute magic. I'm loving it. I don't want it to end. <laughs> Jerry Gerald sounds terrific. Give the crowd a wave as they now move down the backstretch. There are three laps scheduled before the green flag. Jack Root. Well, let's tell you about some of the pit roads rules. As you come down pit road, you're limited to 100 miles an hour. You saw Davey Hamilton show us the little button he uses to ensure. But then when you see your pit, you pull in. You see the marks here? Well, that's to delineate exactly where you have to stop. Once you've come to rest, the crew comes over. Only six guys allowed over the wall. Change four tires, add fuel. A vent man also has to jack the car up. Then you're back out and underway. At the end of pit road, you can pick up speed and try and blend back in. Jerry, 
When these cars have full fuel cells like they do right now, Jack, they're carrying 245 pounds of methanol on board. All that weight makes the car push entering the corner. The crew can simply adjust the front wing and get the car to stop pushing by turning these. However, if the fuel burns off, the car will get a little bit loose. Two months of an adjustment could be a recipe for disaster. The key word today, balance. Balance will win you the Indy 500. Paul? So the field continues to circulate on the first of the three laps. Two parade laps and then the pace lap itself. And for the pace lap, they will be pulling off those safety cars and lead the lone pace car. Mark Page, who's the senior VP of store operations for Pet Boys, the white jacket just behind Brian Howard, the starter. He'll give the green flag that sends this field on their way. Boy, what a great thrill that must be as well. Well, the weather here has not been the most pleasant. There is the weather at the moment. Forecast is the key line. Forecast is for cloudy. The stories that we are going to follow as we watch this 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race, A.J. Boys, T. Menards guys, the former champions, Landyke and Lazier, those with the rocky road, Sharp, Greg Ray, Eddie Cheever, and those who would never like to see second place again, Scott Goodyear and Roberto Guerrero. In the cockpits, the drivers, final preparations, final communications. Well, Paul, it's hard to express the electricity in the air at the start of this race. For the fans as well as the drivers, I'll guarantee you that the hair on the back of their necks is standing on end. The adrenaline, the adrenaline, Paul, is flowing through these drivers faster than their qualifying speeds. And, Paul, danger persists because many times the drivers don't realize the full strength of that adrenaline flow. So as the field comes to the completion of the lap and we begin to look now toward the start of the race itself, there they are on the backstretch at the midway point and this is the second of the two parade laps. Now, we're going to let you enjoy this start in the same way that the crowd does here. Nothing to be said on that final lap. It's all been done. It lies with the drivers now. So we're just going to back out of the commentary. And we will wait for the green flag as the, as the entire field starts on that pace lap. 11 rows of three, 33 drivers. So much is on the line for each and every one of them today. Safety, of course, always a concern. Pace car brings the field off of the fourth and final turn. Billy Boat is the pole sitter. Now, we wait for the beginning of the pace lap at Indianapolis.
wall contact, though. Oh, what a lucky maneuver that was. So immediately the yellow comes back on at Indianapolis, and that, Tom Sneed, is what everybody fears. Well, it really is. Uh, there's a lot of emotion at the start of this race, and fortunately he did not hit anything, but it looks like the motor might be dead. So with Billy Boach as the leader into turn one and the pole sitter, the field is already under yellow. It's the ninth time that a first lap crash has occurred in the Indy 500. The three wide right in front of them there, a lot of traffic. Now somebody got in the brakes a lot sooner than Yaley expected, and he had to slam the brakes on, and you can see the skid marks. I'll guarantee you there's some skid marks inside the cockpit as well. This is... Here we go on board. This is Jeff Ward. Whoa. A lot of smoke there for the drivers behind. One other view. Oh, oh yeah. Right over the top of the camera lens. Now you're hearing from time to time the two-way communications of... That's the Indy Racing League Race Command Channel. And all of the crews monitor that. You may start. You may have bump start on you. And Yaley is back underway. Remarkable. KJ Yaley spins the first lap, first turn at Indy. Saves the car and gets it started. We'll be back for the restart. Get out, get out. Back at Indianapolis, the field is in the north chute. Pace car accelerates. We should be going back to green flag racing after the incident with J.J. Yaley. Several cars came into the pits. Eddie Cheever did. So did Jack Hewitt and Raul Boisel, as well as J.J. Yaley. Here we go. We're racing again. That's Greg Ray, the black car in second place. Here is Tony Stewart on the charge. He moves into third. His teammate, Robbie Buell, right with him. Well, they got a good restart there. Surprised a couple people. Buell now battles his teammate. No, he drops back. Buell drops back into fourth for a moment. It looked like he was going to try and come outside of Tony Stewart. Both the pole sitter brings them off the corner. Onto the long back stretch, five eighths of a mile long. You can see them shuffling around. They're all looking for a spot to try to fit, fit in. Greg Ray darts out looking for any opportunity. On board with Scott Goodyear. Scott being one of the veterans, just going to be taking it easy. He's not trying to do a bunch of uh, passing early. He's just trying to get a feel of this race car and fit right in. That was the A.J. Foyt car of Kenny Breck just ahead of him, the fellow who just started out to the inside of the track. Here comes Goodyear to the inside. We mentioned several cars into the pits, Bozell, Yaley, and Cheever. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, Paul, the miseries continue for Brazilian Royal Boy Sale. He had a fuel pressure problem on the pace lap. He was actually sitting on pit road when the cars come by to take the green flag. They changed the fuel pressure regulator valve. But the car went back out and began sputtering and missing again. He is back on pit road and sits here with the engine cow off. Let's go to Gary Gerald. And a report on J.J. Yaley, Jeff Sinden on the radio with him, said the rookie just got pinched, went down, and with the spin, as you can see, did not hit the wall. The fluorescent colored car is that of Davey Hamilton with Scott Goodyear right behind him in that yellow Pennzoil machine. Well, one person that's missing from that front row is Kenny Breck. He dropped back all the way to about 12, but he's coming back through the ranks. Breck now runs up in eighth position behind Sam Schmidt. Front of the field remains the same. There's both, followed by Greg Ray. Stewart right on the heels of Greg Ray. And Hamilton with a charging Scott Goodyear. Well, Hamilton in the orange car and Goodyear in the yellow car, both G-forces, uh, Paul, and they're, they're working on each other right now. And of course, the three cars in the field, the G-force, the Delara, and the Riley Scott. The real question is between Delara and the G-force. What about Kenny Breck, Jack? He dropped back. Well, Paul, don't forget, this is the first time he's actually started an Indy 500, although he was in the field last year and crashed during the pace lap. Coming up through the gearbox, Kenny Breck missed a gear, and that's how far back he dropped. 
they say now he's working his way back to the front. Looking at the front three, both Ray, Stewart. Battle continues between Hamilton and Goodyear. On board with Stewart, the third place car. Well, Tony's just feeling his way along here. He's real happy with this car after carburation day and uh, using his head early. back a bit still on the chase Robbie Buell has fallen a little further back from his teammate Stewart Buell sitting in fourth crowd still on its feet pole sitter Billy Boat the Conseco car thunders into the first turn across the south chute already he's in turn two weather conditions today, Paul, were quite a bit different than they were in carburation day and qualifying day, so some of these guys might have been surprised. I mean, the air, the air has got the uh, the mentality of a sumo wrestler right now. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> Lineup nine is complete. And Billy Boat continues to lead this field. Greg Ray, you see him, is three-tenths of a second back. Paul, you're talking about the air. I talked to several of the engineers. They said the density of the air will produce less horsepower. Therefore, some of the downforce that you put in these cars, you actually can dial out. You'll have to watch for that during the first pit stop. But the dense air means less horsepower, so it means it's going to be a little tougher to make speed. Tony Stewart and Robbie Buell have already compensated for that by going into fifth gear, and that is their passing gear rather than sixth gear, the overdrive. And so we're expecting to see other aerodynamic changes when they come in for the first stop in the pits area. And right now, Raul Boisel, you heard his prevail. He's been in trouble since before the start of this race. He's climbed out of the car, his helmet off, and Dennis McCormick's driver is with Jerry Punt. Oh, Raul, tough right here. Your day had trouble before you ever rolled off. We noticed you began with a radio problem. days I haven't raised it probably. Car just sputtering would not run at all or did he shut off? No, and uh, I you know, put the throttle on, you know, the fuel pressure just dropped and the car misfire. Another tough break here at Indianapolis for the Brazilian Royal Boisel. Yeah, Paul? Jerry, he's had uh, 10 starts, and this is the fifth time he has failed to finish the 500 miles. It tightens up back at the front. The tightest battle remains this one, that fluorescent car of Davy Hamilton, the Reebok car, and the Pennzoil car right behind him. Back now, back in the field, remember he started 28th, Ari Leyendijk. You're right on board with Ari right now. He's moved up four positions. Well, I saw his hand in the middle of that corner, Paul, on the end car. His hand was quite a ways over to the uh, his right hand was quite a bit to the left, indicating he might have a little bit of understeer in that car right now. Field is playing it very conservative in these early moments of the Indianapolis 500. You ride with Ari Leyendijk. We'll stay right here. See those speeds again they qualified quite a bit faster than that back at the front of the field greg ray makes a move and takes the lead of the indianapolis 500 greg ray comes around boat now is boat in trouble he gets high on the corner tony stewart tries to take advantage of it fuel is closing in so is hamilton well sometimes when you get past you got to roll out of the throttle let the guy go and that gives the second third and there goes Buell by tony robbie Buell comes around tony stewart so at first we thought it was boat in trouble then we thought well stewart's going to get him now stewart is passed by his own teammate and first through six are running right together again tony uh, it's it's a 500 mile race tony obviously was expecting probably to go a little bit farther forward quicker but uh robbie bill took advantage of a situation and, and put the number on his teammate so with his move and the cross of the line greg ray becomes the 163rd different driver to lead the indianapolis 500 since 1911. Buzz Calkins has moved from 18th to 12th. We'll return with more of our coverage of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from our ABC station. Back at Indianapolis, they stuttered on the start, and uh, Billy Boat surged in the lead. Look Kenny there. Brenner. 
There is Kenny Brick making a move on Robbie Buell, and you will note that Billy Boat is just ahead of him. So the two teammates battle. While we were away, Tony Stewart was able to get a round boat and into second place behind Greg Ray. Now look at this fight, all lined up for second. Well, Billy's having some kind of handling problem. He's not as quick as these guys, but he's got them all jammed up behind him. There goes Brett by, on the inside, entering three. A.J. Foyt keeping track of his team. They run right together. But obviously, something wrong with Billy Boat. And Paul, what's wrong with Billy Boat is the weight checker inside the car. He's adjusted it, Tom Steva, as far as it can go. They do not like the balance in the car. So what they've begun to do is take a look at all the tires that they've got lined up here behind Pit Road, try and choose a set that'll give them a little bit better balance. They've been moving those sets back and forth up along the wall here, trying to decide which ones will go on during the first stop. Paul. Scott Goodyear took a look at Robbie Buell for a moment there on the main stretch, but he couldn't get it done. He's going to take a look again, see if he can get past Robbie Buell. And once again, Buell sweeps into the corner well above the line, but at the same time keeps Scott Goodyear behind him in this ongoing battle now for fifth place. Here's Tony Stewart as he comes up on the leader, and Tony Stewart makes a great move. Catches him a little bit in traffic. Greg Ray was a little more conservative when he ran up in that slower traffic, and uh, Tony just blasted by. Boy, what a funny performance out of Tony Stewart. And Paul, Tony Stewart back. is doing that with a car that's got a severe understeer in the car. So watch Tom Steven. He'll probably compensate for it as he goes through the corners. Yeah, because he has been so inconsistent, and that's the indication of an ill-handling car. Well, he, he actually hasn't been that inconsistent, Paul, but uh, it obviously, obviously has some understeer. I didn't notice that on the end car. We'll watch it as it goes down into the corner. You can see this uh, paw-looking thing in the left front. We got a yellow, Paul. We got a yellow. Now trouble on the front straightaway, and it's in fact Stewart. Stewart's engine let go. Unbelievable. Well, Le Leading the race, no warning, gone. And look at the anger in the cockpit. Stewart, fortunately, able to drive it to a stop without causing trouble for anybody. No one got against the wall, including Stewart. It looked like that steering wheel must have been a little slippery the way it slipped out of his hands, Paul. Well, Tony Stewart was furious. He threw the steering wheel, still connected to the two-way radio, out of the front of the car, flings down his gloves in anger. Remember, they had concerns about these engines going to qualifying. They had engine trouble. They finally made a decision to back out of their qualifying engines and use one that was detuned a little bit. But in doing that, they said that they were assuring that the race would run well for Team Menard. Now, one half of the team is gone. Tony Stewart waves sort, to his fans. Sort of an unusual place to pull the thing to a stop. He's down in the groove and he pulls it to the outside. Don't understand that. Maybe we can get some, uh, some more information on why he stopped it in that position uh, with the blown motor. I don't think I've ever seen a car pull up high on the track. Seen a lot of them go low, and of course part of that has to be a product of the positioning on the track when he turned into the corner, and the fact that maybe those rear tires did have oil on them, and the car just decided it was going to go up there and park itself, and Tony was just good enough to get it stopped before it parked itself against the wall. Well, pretty frustrated Tony Stewart right now. Um, just unbelievable. He's shaking his head. He can't understand what could have happened. But like we talked about, they were concerned about their qualifying motors. They were happy with the race motors, but they're not real happy right now. And you saw the uh, X on the flag moments ago that tells you that the pits are still closed. There it is again. The sign is no pit. But as the field comes around, we expect stops, Jack. Well, let's talk to Larry Curry. Did Tony tell you anything? No, we had no warning. Uh, we was sitting there running the race that we wanted to run. We wanted to sit and run in traffic. He knew what he had. He said, I know enough about this now. He went up, set him up in the in traffic, took the lead, and then all of a sudden, bang. So no warning on telemetry, nothing. A litany of engine problems for this team throughout the year, throughout the month. You thought it was limited to your qualifying effort. Now what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, got another car over here in the race with Robbie Buell, and, so we're going to be nervous for a lot more laps now. Gary Gerald.
Jack, we're waiting along with Greg Ray's team. He has taken the lead for the first time in the Indy 500. They await him on pit road, and here he is, number 97. The crew was telling each other, be calm, be efficient now. Let's see what their first test looks like today if they pass with flying colors. They're very deliberate on the front wheels. Very deliberate. They're under the yellow, of course, which helps them now off the jacks, but that's about a 17-second stop, not blistering fast, but they did get everything done efficiently. A quick note on Buddy Lazier. The yellow came about three laps too late. He had a major handling problem, so bad, in fact, that they called him to the pits for a new set of tires and a wing change. Jerry? Had a major problem for Jeff Ward, who had come from 27th to 13th spot in just 22 laps. They had a routine pit stop, but as he's leaving pit road, he turned out and in was turning Stefan Gregoire, and suddenly the right front wing has been clipped off the car number 35. What a tough race for the Tabasco driver after a great run here at the beginning. Let's go back to Jack Aru. Well, Jerry Punch, A.J. Boyd is living. The pit stop by Billy Boat was an abomination. What happened is they came in, made the change of four tires, adjusted on the wing. A.J. Foyt said on the radio, go, 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 and was overruled by one of the crew members. Billy, concerned, didn't know what to do. He waited, paused for three seconds, and it was a costly three seconds. Well, discipline, discipline and precision are what you want in a pit stop at Indianapolis as we continue to watch the work on Jeff Ward's car, but A.J. Foyt's team and A.J.'s guys certainly did not have that. Here's what got... Uh, got the Jeff Ward car into trouble. Again, he got the signal from the pit guy to leave, but he didn't catch in the mirror. He didn't catch Greg Warr coming into his pit stall, and contact was made. So, in regard to the Team Menard guys, there's only one left. In regards to AJ's boys, some confusion on the stop, but they're still very much in the fight with Kenny Breck who started outside the front row in second place behind the pace car. Greg Ray is the leader of the race. He inherited that position when Tony Stewart's engine blew on the front stretch, and that brought out this yellow. Now, we're going to go back and take a look at that situation when Stewart's engine let go, and we're just going to listen to it. The worst sound you can hear, and then silence. Well, the silence came pretty quick. It mixed it up a little bit. You can see the smoke coming out of the back of it, so he's done for the day. So the rest of the field gathered up behind the Chevrolet Corvette pace car now. And there's Tony Stewart. He had to put his helmet on so they could tow the car back to the inside of the track. That's one of the rules. When they come past this time, 24 laps complete, we will be ready to go back to the green flag once again. Actually, that pit stop came at a uh, at a very opportune time. Well, it did for some of them. Obviously, it didn't for Lazier, but uh, we, we saw Ray had a very conservative pit stop. It was a little bit longer than some, but it's really an advantage when you come in first. You don't have to be the quickest in the pits, but you can still get out leading the pits. Jack Aroot. Well, you can see Tony Stewart with his back turned to the pit area. The disappointment you can see on his face. No warning. Nah, I wouldn't even run the car hard. I mean, if I was pushing it, I can understand it maybe, but he's out there kind of riding around, trying to take it easy. The emotions right now for Tony Stewart. Describe them. Well, I mean, this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do in my life. This has been my number one goal, and, and every year I get shit on doing it. So, I mean, how would you feel? Well, and there, of course, in many ways, is the dream of Tony, Tony George and the Pep Boys Indy Racing League to bring guys like Tony Stewart to this, the greatest spectacle in racing. Sorry, like Lion Dyke. It sounded, comes in. it sounded like a smelling, smelly ending for uh, Tony's day. Yeah, but it will only serve to stoke his fires, I suspect. Lion Dyke into the pits. And obviously, it's not routine. It in there's, gear. there's some trouble there. The car stalls. They bring it back. It feels like some kind of clutch problem. He was trying to get it again, couldn't find it. When it did pop in, it just, it just stopped the motor. And now they try to get it rolling again. And in fact, this time, he's pumping the 
All right, and trying to get it here. going again. So Ari Leontag, the defending champion, is in trouble. His month of May has been nothing but trouble. That means that Greg Ray, Kenny Breck, Davey Hamilton, and Scott Goodyear will be the top four as we're ready to come back to the green flag. Jack Aroot? Well, they've taken the off-board starter. You can hear the noises now as the motor's refired. He tries to find the gear. So far, he hasn't. He pulls away. It's obvious that he's lost one of the high gears, Paul. So Ari Leindyke will roar back into the first turn as the green flag comes out. We run again at Indianapolis. A lot of mixing up. Look at the back of the field there, Paul. A lot of mixing it up. People are looking for places to go around. The car that actually was in front as they came down the straightaway is Buddy Lazier. He's still in front, but he is a lap behind the run. Second car in that line is Ray. Scott Goodyear suddenly into the pits. And this doesn't look good either because they immediately went to their pockets for the tools to pull the calling. A lot of top contenders having serious problems early in this race. Jack Arut just reports first gear. Gone is the problem with Ari Leyendijk. Buddy Lazier, despite the fact he's a lap down, looking strong, sitting in front of the leader, and the leader got him coming off the corner, or doesn't have him yet. He, he will get them, I would assume, off of this corner, except Lazier seems to be running at a race pace. Well, the problem with Scott Goodyear seems to be a faulty clutch. If you watch Scott Goodyear in the box, and they're going to have to take a look at it, the crew working towards the rear. If it's a faulty clutch, it could be an early day for Scott Goodyear. Well, Ari Leyendijk, and then <coughs> Buddy Lazier. So two former winners, the only two in the race, are running in front of the actual leader of the race, Greg Ray. Well, Leyendijk had the trouble in the pits. He got out just in front of the leaders. The question is, can he hold off Ray until we have a yellow uh, to give him that opportunity to get that lap back? Yeah, there's the real key. Both of them are trying to keep from being passed and lapped. And Ari Leyendijk, of course, is trying to stay on the leader lap. Greg Ray, the third car in the line, that red helmet. Looking back in the line, Robbie Buell. He's that blue car. And right Paul, the report on Robbie Buell is he likes the way his car is handling in the corner. He does not like the way the car is speeding down the straightaways. He said, I can run with the leaders in the turns, but they eat my lunch down the straightaway. So Robbie Buell, the blue car, pulls up on Davey Hamilton. He's that fluorescent orange car. Well, Buell in the blue car, he might be happy that his motor isn't running that well down the straightaways. It might make it last a little bit longer. From time to time, you get a glimpse of Kenny Breck, second place, just ahead of them. So it's fairly tight, second, third, and fourth right now. Greg Ray leads the Indianapolis 500. 30 laps complete. We've had two yellows to this point, and we've changed the lead three times among three different leaders. And already, Tony Stewart, the hope of Team Menard, is out of the race with a blown engine. It has been a most interesting early going for the Indy 500. And Paul, add problems for the other Team Menard drivers. The latest report on Robbie Buell's car, problems with a water hose. We'll keep abreast of it. Well, Robbie Buell, problems with a water hose. That could be something serious. In fact, if a water hose would let go and flood the cockpit with hot boiling water from the cooling system, it would be a very serious situation. We'll keep track of that, of course. Here are your leaders at Indy, the 82nd front. The leader, Greg Ray, suddenly pulled to the inside of the back stretch. going 50 miles an hour at turn three. He indicated the motor's running, but he doesn't have any Don't gears. The so Greg Ray suddenly, and without any warning whatsoever, darted off a turn two down to the inside. Now, he's simply trying to motor it back to the pits, but as Tom Steve has suggested, he says the motor's running, but you just can't get any speed out of the car. That means that Kenny Brack has assumed the lead. Greg Ray pit, they're saying it's transmission related, so it may be a long drive back to the pit. Transmission problem. Exactly as Tom Steve has suggested. So Kenny Breck picks up the lead of the race with Robbie Buell in second place. That's Breck right there. 
And now we have the battle between A.J. Foyt's team and John Menard's team. Oh, we're seeing a lot of gearbox transmission problems Whoa. here early in the race. Look at this. Another car with a serious engine problem. The yellow comes out on this one as Donnie Beetzler finds himself in serious engine trouble. These motor problems uh, throughout the month, Paul, they've, they've been talking about uh, oil filters and, and, and the bottom ends of these things going bad. They're losing the seventh and eighth rod. Let's go to Jack. Well, Scott Goodyear, you wanted to finish 500 miles. You didn't get anywhere near close. Are you surprised by the number of mechanical problems that are befalling this 33-car field? I don't know what's going on much out there today with everybody else, but I can only say that uh, the car felt great. We got a good start. The guys did a great job in the first pit stop and went to leave the pitch, and the car didn't have any drive. So there's something in the clutch, but, um, you know, we struggled for speed with this G4 strategy and qualifying, but I knew it was a good race car. I knew it was a good race car. I knew that today was going to be a good day. The car was working well, sitting back there watching those guys, and we were coasting. Sixth gear, great field mounted. How about track conditions? How are they? Uh, things were a little green there. The car's sliding around a lot right now in traffic or even side by side with somebody, but that's fine. The car was fine. It's just that it's a short day. Paul? So with Scott Goodyear out, the yellow on, Ari Leyendike and Buddy Lazier make up their lap and are back on the leader lap. Well, give a call to 30-year-old rookie driver Steve Knapp, who started 23rd, and a moment ago, just prior to the yellow coming back out, he had gone all the way to sixth position on the field. In fact, they had to slow him down somewhat. He was so excited after the pit stop. He said, guys, no changes. The car is perfect. We maybe could win this thing. Paul, it's been a while since the rookie has won at Indianapolis. And yeah, Graham Hill, the last rookie to win the Indianapolis 500, the mid-60s. Steve Knapp out of the uh, Formula Ford ranks, and... Uh, He's had an interesting week in the practice and the shortened format here, which seems to have been received well by everyone who participated, fans and competitors alike. Shortened from 13 days of practice down to six and two weekends of time trials down to one. It made for some action-packed time under beautiful skies at the Speedway. Now, they're not so beautiful at this moment. Uh, they are overcast, but still rain is not part of the situation. We go green again. Inside Sharp's car right here, inside uh, Scott Sharp's car. Sharp sits in fourth place. Kenny Breck led them back. Kenny got a little bit of a jump on the guys behind him, and uh, some of these guys, Sharp, these guys got, got a little bit of a run, but they're not forcing the issue yet. Hamilton got a good move on Buell. Buell now sits back in third place. Here comes Scott on the inside on the yellow car. Oh, Scott Sharp very easily around Robbie Buell. Buell comes up high. He came up high and Schmidt had a run on Buell, but he just quite couldn't get there through the short shoot. That yellow and red car is Sam Schmidt, and he is there right now. Right behind him is Eddie Cheever, who has a great run going. This is looking out the back of Scott Sharp's car. And Cheever comes around Sam Schmidt. They got stacked up a little bit and gave Eddie a chance to get a run on those guys, and he made a good move and used it to his advantage. At the front, it remains Breck. He got a glimpse of Buzz Pelkins trying to make a move down to the inside. Good step here, two, three, four wide. Paul, a quick update on Scott Sharp. Remember on the final practice on Thursday, motor problems the first couple of laps out. Never got the speed. By the time they replaced the engine, final practice was over. Next morning, took the car to Indianapolis Raceway Park. Reached speeds of 150 miles per hour on the straightaway on a 5.8 mile oval. Made sure everything was working. They've got to be smiling now at this great run that puts him in the top three. Terrific battle back here. In fact, it's tight all around the course right now. Sam Schmidt, Steve Knapp right behind him. Again, this Knapp come from way back, doing a great job so far. Look at this, three wide as they head into one. Stan Waddles in that black and yellow car. Stan on his first pit stop in the 19 Metro car, they had a miscue coming out of the pits and had to jump for the... Uh, starter and get it started but the crew is right there ready to go and got him back out rather efficiently considering the problem 
Well, look at all these cars bunched up together, Paul. This is what racing is all about. Indianapolis 500, the 82nd running. They're all grouped right together. The leader is Kenny Breck. There you see him. That's Davey Hamilton in second place on the right side of the screen. So the battle is back at the front. There's the numbers on Breck. The numbers really don't tell everything. He really dropped back at the beginning. That, that, that graphic really didn't show that, but he's done a tremendous job coming back through the field. Started on the outside of the front row. His second year, but as we mentioned, Breck last year was involved in an accident before the green flag came out. So this was really a start, and I think it's probably a pretty good move for him to hang back there. Yeah, a lot of these guys have used their head tremendously. Uh, it's, it's surprising because we've got a lot of inexperienced people here. There's Eddie Cheever as he makes a move now to the inside. And Cheever, underneath Sharp, gets around Sharp, now moves into third place. So Eddie's not wasting any time uh, going to the front of this thing. You, you know what's getting me, though, Tom, is that some of these moves are happening so quickly. They sit and sit and sit, and then suddenly you see the move come. Well, they have to, uh, they get that run. They got to stay tucked behind the guy. They work, make the draft work so effectively for them. So they stay behind as long as they can, and then they dart out and try to get underneath them as they enter the corner. Breck, Hamilton, Cheever, the front three. And that's tightening up. Breck leads them into three. We've already gone past the first of the 500 miles. Cross that line at lap 40. Well, not surprising. Uh, Billy Boat, uh, Breck's teammate, is having some handling problems. They, they didn't guess really that close on the handling, and uh, maybe that's what's sneaking up on Breck. Good race here. Here comes Cheever. Cheever goes for second place around Hamilton, and Eddie Cheever into second in turn one. Now gives chase to Kenny Breck, the leader across the south tube. Yellow comes on. Yellow comes on, and the indication is it's for a toe-in. So just as Eddie Cheever was all cocked and ready to get past the Oh, and look who it is. Robbie Buell. Robbie Buell is the reason for the yellow and for the toe-in. This is the second car in the Team Menard stable. The first belonged to Tony Stewart. It was out with a blown engine in turn one. Larry Curry looks on wondering what has happened to their second car. We'll be back. So behind the Corvette pace car, the field is ready to come back to the green flag. And Buzz Calkins will be the leader. He's third in that row, Jack. Well, Robbie Buell, an early day, you said it. You had a good race car. What about the track? Track's good. Race car was great. Um, we, we had a race car. I mean, we were just biding our time out there, which is too bad. Try to tell people about the disappointment. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really disappointed. Just, uh, you just don't understand how hard these guys work. I mean, they've changed a bunch of motors this month, and they've, I feel bad for them because... Uh, you know, we've been together now for two years. We've been waiting for this moment right now, today, so it's too bad. Well, Paul, he's out, but there's still a bunch of them out there waiting for the green. Yeah, but following one of our stories, Team Menards guys are out. Buzz Calkins is the leader of the race as they come back to the green flag. He's actually third in that line. Buddy Lazier right behind him is in second place, and Kenny Breck is in third place. Now, that's owing primarily to the nature of the pit stops. Well, Buddy Lazier had a tremendous break here with the yellows and stuff. He missed that first yellow just by a little, had to pit under the green, and now as we cycle through these oh, things... Oh, Billy Boat, he's slow on the front stretch. The pool center, slow on the front stretch. And no indication at all as to why. It's a sudden slowing. He's got the sticker tires on, so uh, obviously he can't get it up to speed for some reason. Might be that and gearbox. Tom, the reason is because he has nothing left in the gearbox. Another gearbox failure. Oh, oh. crash. And a car in. Oh, oh two. Another car comes through the debris and catches the wall nearly head on. So now we have a serious incident at Indianapolis. And the yellow comes on. 49 laps are complete. Ari Lyonsack just tries to motor through the situation. Well, he's down on the, the warm-up lane or the pit exit trying to get by things. In turn one is this situation. That's Mark Dismore's car right there with the back end of the wall. Looks like Johnny Unser down on the pit road. But I'll tell you what we're going to do. 
There's quite a bit of debris, and the cars are in different shapes, so we're just going to kind of lay back here. Roberto Guerrero, that would be one of the cars. Right. Stan Waddles is the man who has climbed out in the yellow and black. And now Roberto Guerrero comes up out of the cockpit, and Mark Dismore is, in fact, putting his uh, steering wheel out on the front of the car. So for these three, at least, and look at Roberto saying, what happened? Well, maybe we can figure all of that out. Multi-car incident in turn one. Well, heavy traffic, three, four cars side by side. Oh, yeah, down on the inside, they get sideways. The two guys trying to go on their outside. And then the last guy in, I don't, he had to run over debris or got down on the grass. And the car didn't turn at all. He went real close to 90 degrees in. <laughs> Yellow cars backed in early. It's really hard to tell how they got started, but look at that. Come in late. And that is Sam Schmidt, the yellow car that came into the wall. So um, the situation is yellow at Indianapolis after 50 laps. So one-fourth of the race is complete. There is debris all up and down the short shoot out of turn one. We'll return with more of our coverage after this message and a word from our ABC stations. The 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500 continues on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Back at Indianapolis, we are under the yellow flag for a fairly serious accident. Buddy Lazier is the leader with Ken Breck and Davey Hamilton following him, but they are all behind the pace car. Here's what set off this yellow flag. Again, Sam Smith on the inside gets down maybe on the grass. It's enough to get the car sideways. He's, he's lost control. Now everybody else is throwing the binders on, trying to find a way around. Now Guthrie comes in here very late. You can see the wing right there coming down right in front of Guthrie, right on top of him. Nothing to do. He just almost head on into the wall. Real yeah. tough contact. We, ha we had not yet identified that white car. That is now identified as Jim Guthrie, and they are still working with him. He's awake, but he is hurt. Jerry Punch? Well, I'm with Mike McGuire, who is Jim Guthrie's crew chief. And Mike, first of all, do you have any idea from watching what you saw in the monitor what may have happened up there? Well, it looked to me like he was caught up in an accident in front of him. It looked like he had no room to go on the track, and he went into the wall in the nose of the car. A moment ago, you were consoling Missy Guthrie, uh, Jim's wife. What were you telling her? You've gotten some reports, right? I got some reports from one of the other spotters that they saw movement with him. They did take him out on a stretcher. All right, we'll wait for further updates on Jim Guthrie back from the medical center. Paul? Well, he will be going to the uh, medical center here, which is one of the finest that there exists in racing. And Dr. Henry Bach and his crew will do their best. We'll be back. So something we haven't seen at the Speedway. The car is being worked on back in the garage area, but it's a great move for safety by the Pet Boys Indy Racing League. Well, you can see the cars just aren't, you know, a 230-mile-an-hour race car is not made to run into things, and uh, Guerrero didn't get away with that light brush uh, in that instant. There's the way they will come back to the green flag. In fact, they are in that order. And note that John Paul Jr. in the 81 car, who's won the Michigan 500, is up in fifth place now. We're green again. Cheever moves to his right. Oh, look at Breck. The back end washes out a little bit as he changes gears. Into turn one, Cheever looking for Breck. That's Scott Sharp, third place. Uh, Davey Hamilton, the orange car, uh, looking for spots to get around people there on that restart. Fourth car in that line is Ari Leyendike. Remember, he and Lazier fell well behind. Now Leyendike falls a little further backwards. He's challenged by Hamilton. And Hamilton gets around. That's the uh, oil dry they put down on the track for the incident, that's not a problem. The incident, of course, up in the north end. Well, it still can be a problem if, if it's that heavy. They've got to be a little soft pedaling when it goes through there the first couple times so they know what to expect. You know, I haven't thought of that. We, we in fact, say it's not a problem because it doesn't involve an incident, but it certainly can involve a problem for the second guy on the line. Let's go back down to the medical center area and Jerry Punch. Dr. Henry Bach, medical director for the Indy Racing League. Dr. Bach, what's the status of Jim Guthrie? Jim Guthrie's on his way to the Methodist Trauma Center. Uh, he was awake and alert and stable when he left here. He complained of some pain in his right arm and a little bit of left leg pain. So we're going to send him down there for further evaluation. Well, that is certainly great news. Uh, you've talked to the other drivers, and give, considering the, that impact, Paul, uh, we are very, very fortunate. Well, I'm actually surprised that that impact was 
what most of us actually fear, which is nearly head on. And it's good news that uh, he's uh, awake, alert. We're going to look at his arm and leg, and uh, but apparently there's nothing more serious. We'll keep up to date on though of that as well. Well, it's really amazing the safety features that these cars have advanced into, and and a couple years ago, uh, Paul, that would have been a lot more serious of a problem. The battle is at the front of the field at Indianapolis. We're on the 66 lap. They're the leaders. Kenny Brack, followed by Eddie Cheever. Kenny is not getting away from Cheever. Cheever's actually making a run. He's got the draft work, and he's looking for a spot to pull out, but he ain't going to get her down. Well, yeah, oh, there he goes. Look at this. Eddie Cheever tries to come to the inside. Can he intimidate him out of it? He stays right there. Cheever stays in that fight. Battle for the lead at Indy, but no, Cheever can't get it done. You were right, Tom. Well, Kenny, uh, Kenny didn't give him any room there, actually, and uh, kept his foot in it. So uh, Kenny Breck moved to the outside and, and kept the speed up. Remember, for the leader of the race, Kenny Breck, he was in the starting field last year, didn't make it to the green flag, was involved in a three-car accident on the pace lap. Now here he is a year later in leading the Indy 500. But Eddie Cheever is going to try to have something to say about that. Scott Sharp is third. Whoa, Cheever real close to the wall in the exit of uh, turn four, getting a good run on Kenny. He's got another run on him right here. Now Cheever, a little better run going into the corner, and he grabs him. So Eddie Cheever picks up the lead of the Indianapolis 500 in his Rachel Potato Chips car, brand new sponsor for him. Again, inside Sharp's car, but uh, actually Breck was starting to hold up, guys. There was four or five guys that passed up until uh, Eddie got around, and we'll see what happens now. John Paul on the inside of Sharp. John Paul Jr., he goes for the move. Remember, he started the practice here in another uh, team, another opportunity, and then that ride went away for him just before they opened the track. He got this ride, and look at that. John Paul Jr. runs in fourth place, now that, in third. That in-car was uh, was Leyendijk making a move on Sharp. Kari Leyendijk comes around Scott Sharp, so everybody is on the charge at the front of the field. Ari Leyendijk started back 28. Paul, don't forget, Ari Leyendijk has to make as much ground up on the racetrack as possible because every time he pits, he is absent first and second gear. So pit stops become intolerably slow and long. And when you're covering a football field a second, you can lose a lot of time on pit road. Teddy Cheever takes the lead, the seventh different leader of the day. The first time Cheever has led Indy since nine laps back in 1992. It's the battle between Breck and John Paul. Again, that problem with Lion Dyke in the gearbox could become a real problem, especially if we have green light type pit stops. Uh, if they're under the yellow, it's not nearly as severe. Well, the sky here continues to get lighter and lighter. In fact, we do see some patches of blue coming through. You would not have believed that if you had been in the group coming to the track as the gates opened at 5 o'clock this morning. The rain was pouring hard, but Indianapolis Motor Speedway crews and the Pep Boys Indy Racing League, they did a very nice job in getting the track ready to go. The delay was not nearly as long as we had anticipated. They got that track dry and ready to go racing. Cheever Brex, John Paul Jr. Tremendous job by John Paul here that we're looking at the red and white car. Got in this car late after actually Danny and Gaius uh, had an accident early in the month and wasn't cleared to drive. And there's Billy Boat. He comes back onto the track, 19 laps behind the race, and in 22nd position, the pole sitter driving the Conseco car for A.J. Foyt. Again, back to John Paul. He got into on Guys's car. He had uh, trepidation about doing that, getting into somebody's car because they got injured. It's a tough deal. John Paul had been in that same situation himself, but uh, doing an excellent job so far today. Now, owing to that lengthy caution, it is now a little difficult to predict where the next set of pit stops will actually come. And as you already know, a couple of the teams are running deliberately out of order. Most notable there is uh, 
Lazier's situation. Certainly keep track of that. Well, he's I'd, now running back in ninth place. Yeah, he's ninth place, but he's got a lot bigger window as far as fuel's concerned because he stopped so late in that last segment. So it'll be interesting to see if the race comes to him. Now that's what makes Indianapolis so very special is all of the strategy. Uh, at the first two races and most of the races in the Pep Boys IRL season, we would be approaching the end of the race about this point, approaching the 200 mile mark, but it's those 300 extra miles that have not been run before this year that can make all the difference in the world, and that's why the strategy is so critical here. The others tend to be sprint races. This, you really have to plan for. Jerry Punch? And they are having problems now with the car. We are told it may be changing a battery. They, they're working on the electronics on the left side. They had the left side caught off. And of course, the engine cover off. The Jack Miller losing very, very valuable time. A litany of problems for the dentist here at Indianapolis. Yeah, the number 40 press card, appropriate sponsor for Dr. Jack Miller. There's Cheever. There's Boat, slow. The leader is John Paul Jr. You see him there, that blue and black car right behind him, the red and white machine, is John Paul Jr. We are getting very close to what should be stopped for all of the field, or at least most of it. There is your fuel window for Cheever, John Paul Jr., and Kenny Breck, first, second, and third. Just a move from the last pit stop. All four, the top four, are right together on the track. Yeah, they, as, as the fuel window goes, as, the, as we run a segment on a load of fuel, everybody seems to gather towards the end of the segment, and it's going to make for a great race. Cheever, John Paul Jr., Kenny Breck, Ari Leindyke, the top four. Robbie Unser has moved up to fifth place now. Then Davey Hamilton, Scott Sharp, Steve Knapp, Buddy Lazier, and Stefan Gregoire round out the top ten. glimpse of, uh, of Roth there. Well, three wide. We see somebody entering the pits right there, uh, causing some guys to scatter a little bit behind him, but pit stops are coming. John Paul. There's John Paul Jr. as he comes down onto the pit road for his stop. He comes out of second place. Ari Landyke inherits second place. Watching this crew. Sharp. There is the lead of the 51 car. Rachel's potato chip machine, Eddie Cheever. Locking Scott up Sharp the right front. Locking up the right front on the entry. Jerry Punch. 40-year-old Eddie Cheever comes in. He will make a slight air pressure adjustment in the right rear. He's at the car. He's leaning on the right rear. He thinks it may start to get loose. Old Snyder in the crew. Oh, he no. Reminiscent of Lloyd Ruby, who tried to pull away once with fuel hose connected and pulled the side of the car out. Well, fortunately, that wasn't a big problem. They got away with it somehow. Ari Landyke, as the leader of the race, now comes onto the pit. And he will head into the Treadway Racing Team service area. Very steady run for Landyke. Look how carefully he's obeying the 100 mile an hour speed limit in the pit area. And remember, Paul, the biggest concern for this team right now is not four tires, not 35 gallons of fuel, not any sort of adjustment because they will make none. It's what's going to happen in about three seconds. When they drop the jack, they're going to have to push him away. Let's watch. You can see. He tries to run it. Robbie Unser also in, trying to drag race down. As Ari Leyendike has a very good stop under green flag conditions with his problems. Well, he had to leave in third gear. You could hear all the RPMs that he had in the motor, and when he let the clutch out, they really came down, but he got away with it. Well, Ari Leyendike overcomes the ills of that, uh, of that 
problem in the back end of the car and gets it back into the fight and does it without a great deal of trouble. Watching Cheever now with John Paul Jr. right behind him. David Hamilton in there trying to get a new set of Reeboks on that thing. Hamilton in second when he came into the pits. There's Kenny Breck as he slows down. Kenny was scored last time across the stripe, but everyone's heading into the pits as the leader of the run. Well, Breck's running that's, that's, pretty slow. I don't know what he's doing there, more, guys. That's more than just a, a slowing down. That's, Fuel. that's three and four, and he entered on the back straightaway. Some kind of problem there. So A.J. Foyt's other car, Kenny Breck as the pilot may not make it all the way down the pit area to A.J. Foyt's pit. First Other guys trying to get in the pit here. This is going to be tight on the pit entry. First glimpse of that car, we simply thought it was moving down for the pit area. A.J.'s looking down there. He's on the radio to Kenny Breck. I don't know if they ran it dry or not, Paul. Boy, what a shame it would be if they did. Well, Paul, all they asked the crew, asked Kenny, are you still rolling? And Kenny used a lot of calmness and said, yes, I am, but very slowly. They do not know what the problem is. Maybe the concern is that he ran out of fuel. We're going to have to wait and see. Jack, he just went by us at the start-finish line. He's barely going to make it if he gets there. Well, he may, in fact, make it. A.J. Foyt's watching. Well, he's going to make it to the pits, but he's losing sorry about valuable that, time. You heard A.J. say sorry about that, indicating maybe they ran him out of fuel. Could be exactly what it was. Also, what would have happened is maybe Penny inadvertently hit the wrong switch, because one thing that we didn't hear A.J. say on the air, but I heard monitoring his radio, is he said something about we had a problem with the switch. That could be on the dashboard componentry. They did make... A chassis they, they adjustment in the, the front of the car, too. and now the engine has been killed. And AJ just radioed in, just let it wide open, and try and get it to refire. It's not refiring, guys. There it goes. Now my question is, who's more angry, AJ Boyd or Kenny Breck? Well, well uh, anger or frustration, I'm not sure which. That's anger. That's very definitely Texas anger there. Kenny Breck back in night at the front of the field. Lazier is the leader. Good battle there between uh, Lion Dyke and one of the Unser boys. The past couple of laps have been run as high as 209 miles an hour. Here's Buddy Lazier into the pits. He last stopped on lap 61. This is the 93rd lap, Gary. And we expect that they'll make an adjustment on the front wings. First, they take care of the routine business. They get the fresh Goodyear's on. There's the adjustment. Both sides, one full turn, waiting now for the fueling process. The former champion is rolling 14.4. Much better stop for Ron Himmelgarn's team. So when he came in, that gives Eddie Cheever the lead of the race. He'll be pursued by John Paul Jr., who should only be just a few seconds behind. Actually, just one car, just a lap car right in front of the is. yellow car is all that's between him and the leader. That red and white car is John Paul Jr. Eclipse machine number 81. So can John Paul close in with the uh, Lazier stop as well? Davey Hamilton and uh, Robbie Unser able to surge forward. Again, just a tremendous effort here for John Paul and that team. A small team, not a whole lot of funding, and they're right there at the top of the pack. You know, but that's, uh, that's something we can't forget as we run toward the end of this race is that Buddy Lazier is very definitely running out of the pit stop order, and my guess would be that that will be a key strategy coming to the end. And, Paul, you were talking about the great story with John Paul Jr. Remember, he came here, he was supposed to drive for Paul Dyatlovich and Chuck Buckman in the PDM racing entry. But when they had a problem at Phoenix and John Paul failed to qualify, they went $140,000 in the hole. 
They had to look for additional sponsorship. It came along with Jack Hewitt as we watched Jimmy Kite slowing down on the racetrack and on pit road. And what happened was John Paul Jr. is the one that went to PDM and said, look, you need to go with the rookie, Jack Hewitt. And he walked out of there and he said, I'll just find a ride as the yellow comes out. The yellow light flashes on for Jimmy Kite, the fact is fastest rookie in the field as he rolls to a stop. Eddie Cheever is the leader of the race. John Paul Jr. in second. There's a couple of old line tacticians. Bobby Unser working his son Robbie and A.J. Boyd keeping track of Kenny Breck and Billy Boat. We'll return with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from your ABC station. Back in Indianapolis under yellow for Jimmy Kite. They got him back to the pits, and he is back on the racetrack. The Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes is one of the six Goodyear Blimps operating around the world. Three operate in the USA. There are two in Europe and one in Latin America. Now, watching for the leader of the race, Eddie Cheever. He's in the pits. And, Paul, this costume's like a big break for Eddie Cheever. Remember his last stop on the fuel nozzle got stuck and he pulled away? Well, they lost six gallons of fuel. That would have cost him nearly. 4 seconds of routine stop and Cheever is down in a while. Junior, as the leader, is second in the line. He's led a run 784 laps at Indy. And now he leads a lap, finally. Pace car comes off. Remember, John Paul Jr. is the key, second in the line. Well, it's sort of an erratic restart there. A uh, big gap between the top couple cars. Junior jumped out there very quickly. Oh, look at this. Saw the pit guys hunkering down. They saw this coming. They wanted to make sure that they were safe in that no man's land between the pit and the main straightaway. But Ari Leyendijk is in the midst of a big fight. Well, that, that might have surprised him a little bit because there's a couple guys that just poured her down into turn one. It's John Paul Jr., Davey Hamilton, Robbie Unzer, Ari Leyendijk. Those are the top four. Who do we got slow on the infield? Is it? This could have been the one that was smoking for us. It's one of the uh, Hemogarn cars. The, the red might indicate that it's Johnny Unzer. It's very difficult to tell in the rear view. Yeah, it's Johnny. Well, Johnny Unzer, the number nine car, he slows to a stop. Safety team, of course, is right there. They come out from behind the wall. You want to make sure that there's nothing in the engine compartment on fire. And look at the battle continue at the front of the field. Eddie Cheever works his way through traffic as we pass the halfway point at Indianapolis. 100 laps complete. That, that was him. That's Cheever and Lazier right there having a real great battle going on right now. That is a battle for fifth place. Both without question contenders for the win here in the Indianapolis 500. The question is, what happened to Johnny Hunter? His, Lazare's teammate. The fruit race summary, John Paul Jr., the leader, at the halfway point. Average speed, 133 miles an hour. Of course, we've had uh, almost uh, 34 laps of caution. Those guys out of the race, there they are, and that list is longer than we would have hoped at this point, the halfway point. 250 miles. Tom? Well, again, the question mark here is Lazier's teammate, Johnny Unser, just had that problem out of the race. Um, is that an omen for the rest of that team? We'll have to wait and see. And, of course, now they have completed the 101st lap, and in doing so, it is an official race now. Should uh, rain come back into the area, but it sure doesn't look like it, Jack Root. Well, Paul, A.J. Boyd has finally calmed down. I got a chance to talk to Tommy Lamance and confirmed what we suspected. Tommy and the crew on the power team car did run Kenny Breck flat right out of fuel. That's why A.J. was so livid. Makes it understandable. Well, it does, but you know what? The world doesn't want to hear about the labor pains. They just want to see the baby. Okay. You see J.J. Yaley there. Remember, he was uh, one of the cars sideways. In fact, the key car sideways in that first lap incident that brought out the yellow in the first turn. And back in the field and has been moving up. Currently sits in 13th place. Had nine different leaders. Record is 12 different leaders set back in 1993. Only at the halfway point. Leaders are having a little traffic to try to get through right now. 
Back with Ari Lyontag, currently fourth. Again, you can see him take that other grip on the steering wheel. Very unusual. A lot of times you don't change your hand position on the steering wheel, but Lion Dyke seems to be moving him around quite a bit. Lion Dyke's now taking a pretty serious look at Robbie Unzer, who is just ahead of him, red, white, and blue. Robbie's trying to get by Marco Greco in the red car. Uh, the traffic in front of him, Robbie's trying to get his way through traffic. Marco Greco is 17th. Haven't mentioned him much today. Single car effort. Yeah, Robbie got, got a good run on him on the back straightaway there, and he's going to be able to get by. Pretty close, though. They didn't see each other as quick as I wanted them to. Oh, look at Ari. He was trying to snooker. Robbie Unzer there tried to get in below him and surprise him. Well, I think the one he surprised was Marco Greco, because they both got by Greco down that straightaway. John Paul Jr. still the leader. Robbie Hunter is in third. Very punch. Well, Bobby Hunter is in the pits for his son, Robbie. And, Bobby, are you calling the race today for Robbie? Well, I'm trying to. <laughs> Hopefully I am. You've got to be very proud. He's having one whale of a day. Well, we're very proud of him. He's, he's running as fast a race leaders, and the thing about it is that pit stops are hurting us because he has absolutely no rear brakes at all on the car. So every time he has to stop, he flat spots the front tires. So that's really a hurting thing, but other than that, he's very fast on the track. What have you told him about the final 90 laps, and how do you play it? Oh, that's a long way off. We're going to worry about that when the time comes. three times and always won by a member of the Unser family. Another May 24th. Well, what are the chances that guy can do it? Interesting comment, though. No rear brakes. Now, a lot of racetracks, that would uh, pretty much end your day. At this place, uh, you don't use the brakes. Uh, when you're at speed, it's just traffic and pit stops that make brakes be very critical. We'll take a look as they hit the line. We're looking at John Paul Jr. 210, but Davey Hamilton in second place was the quickest thus far. We'll look to see who's the quickest. Boy, they're all quick. There's Robbie Unzer scoring up at 211.7. A little bit faster pace than earlier. Uh, we, we looked earlier. They were in the 208, 209 area. Now the track is actually getting faster. And Robbie Unzer is the fastest of those running at the front of the field. John Paul Jr., Davey Hamilton, Ari Lyonsike, Buddy Lazier. That's the top of the order. The 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500. Been a most unusual race to this point. 108 laps complete. John Paul in the red, white, and blue car. Or, I mean, so, sorry, that's the, one of the answers trying to get by Bo Sale, who's down a bunch of laps. Remember, he had the problem right at the beginning. Yeah, he's 35 laps behind the lead of the race. And, uh, there comes Ari past him as well as he continues his pursuit of Robbie Unzer. Again, they're in a segment of the race where they're just cruising. They're just trying to keep the car underneath them so it'll be with them at the end of the race. Running back in 10th place is Stefan Gregoire. You ride with him now, the Blue Star car. The the old blue car finally got themselves a sponsor. They got all kinds of names on her right there. Uh, you can see the 33.0 on the dash there. Uh, again, that's a fuel reading, uh, an indication when he sees that in the dash, he's got to be looking for the pits. 35 gallons of methanol fuel, the capacity on these cars brought it down from 40 when they came out with this new formula for the Pet Boys Indy Racing League. And normally aspirated engines and the uh, whole new chassis design of the G Ford, the Delora, and the Riley Scott chassis. Yeah, if you look at uh, Stefan's hands in the corner, number one, he doesn't take a new grip on the wheel, and the wheel looks a lot steadier. It's not vibrating around nearly as much as it is in Lion Dyke's car. Stefan is running in 10th place, uh, a lap behind the leader. He got caught in that on a pit stop. Ari Lion Dyke. Now, see him fighting the wheel a lot more. It's jerking around a lot more. 
Um, I don't know what, uh, that's an indication. Maybe we got a G-Force here with Lion Dyke as compared to the Delar that uh, Stephens in. Firestone tires on our Lion Dyke car. but they put quite a bit of front wing in that car, Paul. For leading the race and going as fast as he was, it's surprising that they put that much wing back in that car. There's our new leader, Davey Hamilton, the Reebok car. He started in eighth place. Robbie Unser came into the pits. Marco Greco came into the pits. Those were all routine service. Great job by Davey. He's been close to the front all day uh, from Boise, Idaho, a big modified sprint car type guy, and it's fun to see Davey at the front of this pack. Ari Lion Dyke is 1.6 seconds back. Davey Hamilton, the 10th different leader today. The race has been action packed. We had one major incident, six cars involved. Five of the drivers were checked out at the hospital. And uh, we've talked with all of them, Sam Smith, Mark Dismore, Roberto Guerrero, Stan Waddles, and Billy Rowe. Jim Guthrie was alert and awake as he came to the track hospital. They were worried about some pain in the leg and an arm. They sent him on to Methodist Hospital of Indiana here. And we are now waiting for the report back from Methodist Hospital to update edition on Jim Guthrie. Leaders coming in, Paul. Davies heading towards the pits. So now Davy Hamilton onto the pit road with Ari Lion Dyke second place right behind him. traffic situations we got good racing going on sharp underneath the doctor there surprised the doctor a little bit and Lazier had to sort of watch when the doc's coming in yeah, that's enough for him now 
remember he's had his problems in the day in that 40 car and he is uh, back coming down on the pit road one more time. This is something different as Kenny Breck in and out of the pits, but you saw that uh, Dr. Jack Miller was undoing his straps and has come to a stop. So uh, he has a problem that is more than just routine and he's not gonna make it to the pits at all. Yellow comes on. And that's because of Dr. Jack Miller in the number 40 car. So Eddie Cheever is the leader at the Indianapolis 500. And we have our sixth caution of the day. second running of the Indianapolis 500. This ABC Sports special presentation brought to you by Pep Boys, the official sponsor of the Indy Racing League. Rogaine, extra strength for men. Degree, the body heat activated antiperspirant. And Ross Brood Coors Live, who reminds you the three most important words are hey, beer, man. Back in Indianapolis, 123 laps complete. We are under caution. Next on ABC Sports, the J.C. Penney LPGA Skins Game from the Stonebriar Country Club in Frisco, Texas. Skins Game features 20, 30, and $40,000 holes. Now, as we were away, the leaders came into the pits. The uh, first of those to head onto the pit road was Eddie Cheever. Look nice and routine, uneventful, good work by the crew. Team Cheever. And coming in, actually getting across the line, it'll be scored for a lap in the lead was Buddy Lazier. Again, because of pit placement relative to the start-finish line. Again, this was a smooth stop as well. Again, these, these stops are under the yellow, Paul, so they can take their time, be a little more deliberate when it's under the yellow. A couple turns on the front wing for Buddy Lazier. Gary Gerald? Lee Koonsman, tell us about the change you made on the front wing. What are you looking for? Well, we're just basically trying to keep the car balanced. We've been pretty lucky all day keeping it balanced. Uh, I thought we were in trouble early on. We had a little tire problem early on, a uh, pressure problem. Uh, we must have ran over something, but uh, we had to make an early stop and got us out of sync. But luckily, things fell our way, and we made a couple of uh, different moves, and, and we're, we're now in pretty good shape, I think. You're on the Goodyear option tire. That way you started the race, so you've stayed consistent in that respect, right? That's correct. Uh, they're working very well. We're not having any chassis problems at all. It, it, it's working very well. We had a little problem early on, but that was a pressure problem, uh, something that can't be controlled, you know? That's the story on Lazier looking for win number two at Indy. Jerry Bunch? Well, the veteran Owen Snyder's calling the shots for uh, Eddie Cheever. And, Owen, you guys have had a flawless day. Haven't touched much on the car, have you? No, we really haven't. Eddie's been uh, Eddie's been real happy with the car. We've, uh, in fact, he's been so happy he left the pits a little early one time. He's wanted to get back out there, and we still had our fueler plugged in. So uh, we've made a mistake. You know, we made that about lap 100, and uh, we made up for it. We got back in. We're back in sec now, so we're, you know, we're two stops away, and uh, we may even start trimming her out here. Might start picking up a little more speed for, for the end of this thing. All right, Owen Stoddard, remember he called the shots for Allister Jr. back in 1992 when he won. Well, John Paul Jr. back in the lead under this caution. It's the Pet Boys Indy Racing League and the 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. 126 laps complete. We have just heard from the hospital, Methodist Hospital of Indiana, in regard to the condition of Jim Guthrie. He is going into surgery for a fractured right arm, and he also has contusions on his right leg, but that is particularly great news when you consider the impact that he saw nearly head-on with the wall. So we hope that Jim Guthrie recovers very quickly from that surgery and those injuries. John Paul Jr. is the leader of the race, but he, uh, he's got a problem ahead of him. There are a whole gaggle of cars lined up ahead of John Paul Jr. as they come back to the green. You can see him kind of sitting out there. There he is, right behind John Paul Jr. And we'll be looking at the battle behind him, third, fourth, and fifth. That's Hamilton, Lyondike, and Robbie Unzer. Well, that's 
Uh, is that Scott Sharp leading him down to this uh, green flag restart? He is almost two laps down. The leader is eight laps or eight cars behind in that line. You see behind the two yellow cars, John Paul's looking for a way to get around. He's looking for something. Right now behind Scott Goodyear as he heads into the corner. We look at Hamilton and Lion Dyke. Hamilton, the fluorescent orange car, Lion Dyke, primarily black and white. Well, Cheever, on board the, Lion Dyke. the Cheever got underneath the answer uh, in the short shoot. I think he might have surprised him. There's Eddie Cheever. You just get a glimpse of me, third car in that line, right behind Lion Dyke. There he is. Boy, good fight as they came back to the green here. A lot of traffic here, Paul. They got to be careful. Somebody's out in the high groove. He'll be out on the throttle. Maybe oh. Hamilton. Ooh. Marco Greco. Was surprised. Everybody's diving in there, and uh, Marco wasn't expecting that last one. Here comes Scott, uh, Jeff Ward. He's on the fly. Boy, look how these things are changing here. Well, Jeff, uh, had he, trouble? he had trouble early, but he's got the thing running awful fast right now. Three laps behind the lead in 14th, but he's obviously matching the pace of the front of the race. inside Ward's car now. We haven't been inside Jeff's car all day. He had problems earlier. The orange tape on the wheel, traffic ahead. Orange tape, of course, to help tell him when he comes into the pits that the wheels are all straight and pointed right. Look at how fast he's flowing. Well, again, he got a good grab from both those cars, was able to tuck in behind and, and get them down the front straightaway. Isn't that amazing? We've seen that several times before today. Cars that just suddenly are really flying. Now, Bell second, third, and fourth. Hamilton, Lion Dyke, Cheever. All right together. Again, traffic right in front of them. Everybody looking for a toe. Davey got his, but look at Harry. He has a, even a better toe. All right, Lion Dyke tries to get inside Hamilton as they both come oh, around. Wheel, wheel. Oh, look at him. Come off the corner. They come side by side through the chute. Lion Dyke forges ahead. I can't believe Davey was able to hang on out there. He had to roll out a little, but he didn't roll out of it much, Paul. Eddie Cheever gets trapped back there, but he'll be moving fairly soon as well. There he is. He makes the move to try and stay in contact with Davey Hamilton. John Paul Jr., the leader, we're focusing second, third, fourth. Yeah, and for that matter, fifth, it was Steve Knapp. You see him back there. Yep, Steve Knapp. And the second orange car looking car back there, just moving around underneath. Report coming in from one of the observers that Billy Boat, who has not been in a great position, 19 laps behind the lead in 20th, may have finally shut it down. And there he is. Well, Billy's had a tough day. Uh, this looks like it's going to be the end of it. Well, but we have suggested that before, and the new rule that allows them to get the cars out of the pit area, which is strictly for safety. The yellow comes out for Billy Boat, but it does, uh, it certainly helps them get these cars repaired and get them back into the fight. Eighth yellow of the day, A.J. Foyt. One car left. If Billy's out, that's Kenny Breck, and he is currently see him there in ninth place. So, John Paul Jr. is the leader in the race, but he's eight cars back in that line. Ari Lion Dyke is uh, second in the race itself. Cheever is third. Davey Hamilton is fourth. And Steve Knapp, the rookie, is fifth. Also, there is the story of Scott Sharp, who currently runs in eighth place, one lap behind the leader, but he's ahead of the leader, and he may, in fact, be able to get his lap back uh, as they come around for the green flag. He's right there positioned so that he can, in fact, do that. Well, actually, it's John Paul that's leading the pack this time on this restart. We, we had that short yellow there, Sorry. Paul. So the, uh, we got all the leaders at the front, some lap cars in between. This is going to be fun to watch. Yeah, this is an in line for the lead. There's Lion Dyke going under Yaley. And Shaley. Look at Fast Eddie right behind him. Cheever chasing Lion Dyke. Lazier on the outside looking for a spot around. Lazier was looking for racing room, got caught up behind Yaley. Cheever in pursuit of Lion Dyke. 
Van Dyke, of course, chasing John Paul Jr. Roberto Guerrero that they moved to the inside of, not a factor. Roberto's lucky to be in there. He made the repairs from the big incident earlier, and now he's back on the racetrack. The six-car accident up in the north end. And once again, good news on Jim Guthrie. And the fracture will be repaired surgically and a, a contusion. So best wishes out to Jim Guthrie. Hope we see you back at the track soon. Well, we've got the top three running uh, nose to tail right now, now, Paul, with no lap traffic in between them. They were all able to clear the traffic without a problem. John Paul, Jr., Lion Dyke, Cheever, one, two, three. All right together there. John Paul has 1.3 second advantage. the fuel load down the car's going from neutral to just about where the balance is and he likes it right now now as he runs the rest of the fuel down you know guys it'll go just a little bit loose as mr unson used to say well hopefully they can catch it with the controls the driver has on board he can move the anti spray bars both front and rear and he's got the weight jacker that uh, the jack's been talking about previously the weight jacker is actually a device on the right front spring he can uh, raise or lower the right front corner of the car in doing so he transfers weight back and forth across the front of the car and that really affects how the car handles and gets through the corner he's closing in now the lap leaders john paul with 31 battles right up there at the front Scott Goodyear got his car off the track. He was 38 laps behind the leader in 22nd when he did that. First, second, and third still battle. Last time around 212 miles an hour. Well, for Goodyear, for a guy that's 20, 30, 10 laps down, uh, you know, it's hard to keep the emotional edge up there. And, and sometimes you can be just a hazard to other people when you're out there and, and know you don't have a chance to win the race. They come around, Roberto Guerrero moving slowly on the front step. Stretch and Lion Dye tries to make a move. Can't make anything work there. Cheever closing Lion Dye. There's where the fight is right now. It'll be fun to watch as the fuel load goes down as they put miles on these tires and, and how it affects the handling of the cars as they go through the cycle of pit stops. 140 laps complete. Now look at the time dip difference here. This is Lion Dyke's closure on John Paul Jr. over the past three or four laps. Well, Cheever is catching Lion Dyke, so we're going to have a, a three-car pack up here shortly, Paul. And Tom, it's interesting you're talking about that chase up front. Keep in mind, John Paul has the favorite Delara chassis that's been so impressive this month. Lion Dyke's in a G-Force. It didn't respond to the hot weather. We've had periodic sun breaking through. It is getting warmer. We wonder if that'll become a factor before this race is complete with now less than 60 laps to go. Well, Gary, not only the chassis combination, but also the tires. John Paul's in Firestone. The next two guys are on Goodyear's. And, of course, as Gary mentioned, with uh, less than 60 to go, the pit stop strategy will also now begin to become so critical in this 82nd running of the Indy 500. Look at first, second, and third right together. Well, this is fun to watch. A lot of guys felt that Goodyear had made some big gains on the Firestone car. Firestone's won the race the last couple years here, but uh, they feel Goodyear has closed the gap, but some people still feel the Firestone 
throughout a long run will dominate the good year. Last time around, John Paul Jr. felt the pressure. He kicked his feet up fastest of uh, the group in the lap to 211.9, while Eddie Cheever ran at 211 flat, as did Ari Leyendijk. John Paul at this time. Again, uh, you got a good year in a Firestone battling for second and third. Down the long back stretch, headed north, turning back towards the west. Oh, what a great battle. Well, there's the uh, central floor window upcoming. So, we expect John Paul Jr. in the pits just any time now. now. By that graphic, you see Cheever has uh, the option to go a lot farther than the other two guys in front of him. And that's going to make a world of difference is Cheever's positioning toward the end when John Paul makes the stop. We assume that he just have one more to go. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Paul, it may well be that John Paul is going to be the first in the sequence, and that could be a huge disadvantage. In fact, the crew has just gone over the wall. The tires are out, and he may really have to stretch these last two loads of fuel. Jack? Well, Gary, Skip Paul says exactly that's the case, because he's going to wait till lap 151 to bring his car on a pit road. Hopefully, they'll be able to do it with one final stop. Gary? Eddie Cheever came back in. Remember, guys, on lap 123 and topped it off. He can go all the way to lap 156 before he'll pit. They'll make a wing adjustment. He's complaining the car has too much push in heavy traffic. Well, so there are some of the tactics that will play out toward the end of this race. Two cars separated in pit stops uh, and then Eddie Cheever. So. It was interesting, uh, Jerry. You indicated that uh, Cheever's got some unders here, some push, and he's and he's uh, concerned about that. But believe me, understeer is a lot better condition to have than the oversteer condition, the other side of that coin. Lion Dyke closes a bit, coming into the first turn. We're listening to John Paul Jr.'s two-way communication system. Again on board Lion Dyke again as he's trying to get the, the crosshairs on John Paul. Cheever is right there behind this car. Barry Lion Dyke, look at this. There's John Leader. Paul Jr. goes for the pits. Leader's in. You see him get it walled down. He's on the brakes hard to get under the 100 mile an hour speed limit. That costs the car to wiggle. The Lion Dyke will pick up the lead, Eddie Cheever in second, and Gary Gerald awaits the arrival of John Paul Jr. The Pell 3 team is in flawless thus far today. John Paul shakes his head no. He declines the drink. A veteran tough luck driver was in a wheelchair a year ago. No changes. They're cleaning the radiators, taking extra time, and they pulled a big chunk of debris out of there. Fueling complete. Oh, it's not a real good stop. Better than 17 seconds. Coolers, and that could have driven the engine temperature through the roof and taken that car out of the run. So with clear cooling once again, John Paul Jr. back into the fight. Lion Dyke is the leader. Fever is seven tenths of a second back. And you might have heard over John Paul's radio, they said reset the fuel so you know exactly what kind of mileage you're getting and how far you can go in this next segment. Ahead of the leader, Ari Leyendijk. 
They are the leader, John Paul Jr. and Ari line back. Now Ari trying to make a move. Three Getting wide here. A four, four wide. wide. Cheever's looking for another spot. Cheever had a run on line, Dyke, but again, four wide, he had no place to go. Oh, well, Cheever was just trying to find any place that he could go as they went three, then four wide, and the whole complexion at the front of the field continues to change. Lion Dyke in. Lion Dyke. Here comes Lion Dyke. He's probably thinking, I got to get out of this mess. That was a little heavy on the traffic side. Boy, that was very tight. Ari Lion Dyke looking to team Treadway for service, Jack. And while Ari is coming in one lap sooner than he wanted to, the concern was the possibility of running out of fuel. Skip Ball leads the crew working from the right side and of the right front tire. He had a problem with the gun on the That's right side. That's right, He had a problem with the gun. 13.8 is Eddie Cheever. And Robbie Unser finally makes his way back on a pit road in Eddie Cheever's team car. Another one of the two Rachel Potato Chip cars. Oh, looking hard. Right. He is struggling to get back to speed. He's probably, he might have lost another gear in that gearbox. We, we talked about the gear problem he had earlier. That car doesn't look like it's going to move. Well, the last time he really dumped the clutch, high revs got it out of there. It's not working this time. Ari Leinzak, see him reach down, go for the gear shift. Hey, Paul, here's what happened. As we, you and you and me and Tom, just suspected, you can't run those clutches and slide them the way they have. The latest on the radio from Ari Leinzak is that he thinks he has flipped the clutch. Well, you can run without some gears in the gearbox. You can't run without the clutch. Now will they go yellow for Ari Leinzak? Well, he's got a spot there he could pull it off and maybe get out of the way, but... Uh, looks like he might be planning just that. No, it actually nope, looks he, like he he's going the other way. I thought he, thought he was going to turn out there, and so they could come out and pull him back in. He's not going to do that. So Eddie Cheever picks up the lead. Davey Hamilton in second. Rookie Steve Knapp in third. The yellow comes out for Eddie Cheever, the ninth of the day. Or for uh, Ari Leinzak, the ninth yellow of the day. He got just a few feet beyond the area where he could have been pulled back in and then pulled off onto the grass. The defending champion. Well, now the question will be Eddie Cheever. How long will he stay out? He was originally scheduled to come in for pit service on that lap, but with the slowdown with the yellow, be able to stay out a little bit. What incredible luck for Eddie Cheever. Well, it's the fate of the 500, Paul. I mean, just things go your way sometimes, and, and some days it's not your opportunity. So Eddie Cheever stays out as the yellow comes on. John Paul Jr. is now one lap off of the pace. Yes, that's very interesting, Paul, to see that... Uh, he thought he was going to have to get the car exactly right as far as handling was concerned if he had Lion Dyke and more competition. With Lion Dyke out, he figures he's got enough. He can go a little more conservative and still get the job done. Here we go, Green, once again. There is Eddie Cheever, that blue and black car, number 51. You see him run with the stickers on the, on the, on the tires still. It takes a couple laps to get those things up to temperature and scrub the stickers off the brand new tires. Cheever, Lazier runs in second. Then rookie Steve Mann. Then Davey Hamilton and John Paul Jr. Look at that move down inside by Lazier. Three or four wide, dropping to the inside. He's under Jack Hewitt, comes up behind Dr. Jack Miller. And under the heading, you want to be lucky or good, Eddie Cheever has been both as we watch Buddy Lazier leading the race and then got a yellow at exactly the right time to make a pit stop under that yellow. Was that Jack Hewitt, the yellow car, right behind was there? Hewitt is getting a little racy late in the race. Well, the joy of so many short track fans, Jack Hewitt. Had a tough time making it into the race. Crashed once, fun once, still made it into the Indianapolis 500. Currently runs in 12. Buddy Lazier, the 1996 winner, overcame the problem with his fractured spinal cord. Or spine. And here comes Lazier. That's the interval, first to second. 
just a little over one second. Wait, one second, but if you look on the, on the computers, uh, Lazier's running a little bit quicker on the last couple laps. Motor Speedway, the running, the 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500, 158 laps of the 200 are now complete. We've had uh, nine different caution flags today for 47 of those laps. That slowed the race down just a bit, but slowed even more was the simple fact that uh, there was rain in the Indianapolis area and it delayed the start by nearly uh, 40 minutes when they finally got the race underway and the LPGA skin game will be coming on right after the Indianapolis 500. Eddie Cheever is the leader in second place. Just uh, 1.1 second back is Buddy Lazier, the 1996 winner of the Indianapolis 500. And rookie Steve Knapp, look at him. Knapp in the fluorescent car trying to do battle with Buddy Lazier. It's a fight for second place. Let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. Well, Buddy Lazier's teammate, Johnny Unser, had to call it today. Johnny, what put you out? Well, I think we lost the motor. I'm not really sure, you know, but I'm pretty sure the motor let go. It's unfortunate, you know, because the car was good. We were pretty much where we wanted to be. We were running in the top ten on the lead lap, and the thing let go, and the car was really coming to us. So now I want to see Robbie hang in there, and I'm glad to see Buddy up there in the front. So, you know, i got to just cheer them on right now. So today for one of us, anyway, let's do the Jackaroo. Well, Larry Leyendijk, we've documented the clutch problem on your Radio Shack car, but let's talk about the drivers that are still out there. You've run against all of them. Who do you think has the advantage right now? Right now, I think Eddie Cheever is pretty strong. John Paul Jr. is running really strong, but, uh, you know, my car just got really, really good, and if I was on my own, my car was just flawless. A little bit of pushing traffic, but, you know, it was still, still pretty early in the race. But I knew... Uh, Sooner or later, the clutch, the clutch is going to uh, be a problem. Well, think about this. He only needed one more stop with that clutch, and he could have gone the distance. That's the kind of difference made between uh, victory and failure at Indianapolis so many times, time and time again. Well, John Paul Jr., who's been a leader of the race, is now in danger of going a lap down to Eddie Cheever. Eddie Cheever is making mincemeat out of the rest of the field. Cheever, they've got this thing hooked up. Uh, they didn't make any change in the last stop. That's always a good sign when you get the car where you want it before the very last stop, because that can put you in or out of the money. 163 laps. We're now into the final 100 miles of the Indianapolis 500. And Eddie Cheever, the leader, followed by Buddy Lazier and Steve Knapp. John Paul Jr. sitting just in front of the leader, the only other car on the leader lap. John's a Paul's actually hustling this car pretty good. He can't afford to get a lap down, obviously, so he's trying to keep Eddie behind him. Eddie just got a great run off that corner, though. And here is Eddie Cheever. He gives a little wave to John Paul Jr. as he puts him one lap down. We'll return with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from our ABC station. The 80 second running of the Indianapolis 500 continues from ABC's Wide World of Sports. The blue and black Rachel Potato Chip car number 51 of Eddie Cheever just clicked off a lap at 210.3 miles an hour as the leader of the Indianapolis 500. You see Cheever there, then an intervening car, and then the 91 car, that purple and yellow machine that belongs to Buddy Lazier. And now looking back for third place is Steve Knapp. He drives the number 55, a rookie at Indianapolis. John Paul Jr. really turned the pressure on, ran about 211 miles an hour the last lap, but of course, just before we went away, you saw that he went one lap behind the run of the race. Well, he, he's, Paul, he's going to try to get that lap back, and I don't understand why his speed's fluctuating so much. The speed, we indicate the leader's running 210. Uh, the real key to that is second and third place are running in the 209 bracket right as we speak. As a matter of fact, that's exactly the number that they picked off on the last lap. While Eddie Cheever is still running at 210.2, so he only fell off a tenth on that last circuit around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, two and a half miles. Davey Hamilton, a lap behind the race, is in fifth. So is Scott Sharp, two laps back. 
Robbie Unser and Kenny Breck. Three back, Mitchner, Yaley, and Stefan Gregoire. But how about this story? This nap kid has done a tremendous job. 23rd to third, that's a, that's a pretty good effort. After carburation day, he was very concerned about pits. Check it on the fuel window for the first and third place car. First Eddie Cheever. A lap ago, his window opened up, so now if we were to get a caution flag or anything would happen, and he were to pit, he could make it the rest of the way. Owen Snyder says they will not off the pit until lap 180 to 182. Now the third place car, Steve Knapp, talking with Jim Frazier, likewise, this time by, their fuel window opened up, they're okay on fuel, but they may not pit the lap 182 to 185. Let's go to Gary Carroll. And I think we'll see Buddy Lazier long before that. They haven't given us a specific number, but it looked like John Hemmelgarn giving four fingers to the crew just moments ago. That would make it 175. Now, Buddy, on the last stop, they made a change. He didn't want the change, we're told. They've been trying to balance the car since. He's been fighting the push. Now it looks like we're three laps away from Buddy Lazier's final stop. And, of course, for all of those, that would, in fact, be the final stop of the Indianapolis 500. 172 laps now complete. We're working number 173. And Cheever slowed down quite a bit. 206 miles an hour on the last lap. And a uh, little note to our local stations, we will be uh, doing a runover station break here coming up in just a bit. Yeah, actually, there's a little bit quicker than Cheever the last couple of laps, so... Uh I don't know if that's cheaper in traffic or uh, or not, but it's interesting to see if Buddy's going to be able to close this gap. Pace for Cheever came back up 210.2 miles an hour. Might be getting a little bit of a toe helping him out there. So Eddie Cheever is the leader of the Indianapolis 500 on the 174th lap. We'll be back after this from our local station. The 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500 continues from ABC's Wide World of Sports. Well, just a moment ago, the yellow light flashed on once again at Indianapolis. You're riding with Greg Waugh, who uh, slowed down on the front stretch. And here is the reason Greg Waugh certainly it. Look at that. Whoa. Well, and he, he kept going. Well, he got way out of the groove, and he was just trying to inch it around the corner, and finally got up the marbles, and the thing did a couple tail slappers. You can see he's missed the groove. For some reason, he's way up high. He's just trying to get to the corner. He gets a little marbles just on the exit, and the thing does a little tank slapper, and he slaps the wall. Well, Scott Sharp was working past him there, and he saw the debris, uh, paper debris on the front of his car as he uh, slapped it up against the wall and uh, despite the fact that the no pit sign is out at least one competitor is going to find his way into the pits and that's your early leader of the race greg ray 76 laps are now complete and the assumption would be we showed you the fuel window a moment ago you've heard the report from the pits that uh, the three leaders of the race will all peel off and head for a pit stop as they come around at the conclusion of this lap and that stop for all three would also take them to the end of the 500 miles and turn this from an endurance run into a sprint and just as we suggested not just the leaders but it seems everybody has taken this opportunity to roll down onto the pit road the 51 car is the leader of the race eddie cheever well, they, they bunch up in the pits. Uh, they're all trying to get to their pit box. There's second place, the 91 car of Buddy Lazier. And Steve Knapp would be the other. Here's the first two. Eddie Cheever down on your lower left. And Buddy Lazier upper left. Cheever out first. Uh, good, clean, fast stop for Cheever. He's almost too fast for Cheever. Boy, that was a good stop. Lazier. And he's away. Boy, traffic coming out pretty quick. Speed limit in the pits, 100 miles an hour. And John Paul is having trouble in the pit lane. They're pushing him. I don't know if it's going to catch or not. So John Paul Jr. struggles a little bit to come out as the rest of the leaders, Lazier, Cheever, and Knapp, make their stop. It should now be a run to the 500th mile at Indianapolis. Time to Corvette pace card to turn three. Jeff Ward, as he came past the line, was in front 
of the field. But you can see that Eddie Cheever, the leader of the race, there he is, is the second car in line. And then there are two cars separating Cheever from Buddy Lazier. So it will make for an interesting restart as we look at the lineup at the 178th lap mark. Of course, remember, the race changes so much in its complexion in these final laps. Seldom the leader with 10 laps to go, the leader at the finish. Green comes out, Cheever easily handles up. You Jeff see, Ward. You and see Lazier looking for a spot underneath. He can't, doesn't have enough of a momentum to carry himself on by. In the short shoot, he'll go underneath. So Lazier finally gets rolling up. He runs in second place. In traffic, the orange car, you see Davey Hamilton looking for a way to get around. Yellow's back out. And again, no obvious indication as to why. Well, that certainly could be an indication. Look at the if field. Jack Hewitt Look has a motor gun. Look at the spray gone. coming out of the back of that car, and he was right up in the groove. Uh, it would have been nicer for the, for the other traffic if he would have kept that thing down a little because there's a lot of fluid coming out of the back of that thing. So 46-year-old rookie Jack Hewitt apparently has an engine let go, and that brings out the 11th yellow of the day and reminds us of how quickly things can change at Indy. Well, I guess I didn't know that fuel if it came out of the engine compartment of the cockpit. Already, Cheever begins to pick the pace up. A big advantage to have lap cars in between you. It really helps uh, you get away from that second place car and keeps him from getting a big jump on you. But look at Lazier. He's right there. He's got a toe. He's going to get by both these guys getting into turn one. He actually got a toe off Cheever's teammate, Robbie Unser. And now Lazier on the charge. Lazier in second, trying to catch the leader onto the back stretch. But Lazier's wife, Kara, watches from the pit area at the speedway. Just got married last fall. But he did a tremendous job on that restart. He had a couple cars in between him, and it could have been a lot uglier than that, but uh, did a tremendous job, timed it just right, and, uh, and the leader didn't get away from him very far. Well, he did. He knew exactly where he was going. Tom, we've talked time and time again as Buddy Lazier looks down, checks his dash, and continues his pursuit. We've talked about the advantage that being a winner gives you, some secret knowledge. Well, yeah, it gives you a lot of experience, and that's what Buddy's using right now. These restarts and things are very critical. But the key for these guys right now is if Buddy got his car adjusted, got the handling where he wanted to, if he made the right adjustments on that last stop. Now, we're not sure if Cheever made any, any adjustments. Remember the stop before, Paul, they decided, Andy decided not to make any change because he thought uh, that uh, Lyondike was the guy he had to race. But Lazier is right there on his back. And Tom and Paul, Buddy Lazier pulled out all the stops as he came to the Sydney 500. They went back and put the dog paw, reminiscent of the year that he won this race from his dog, Indiana, up on the tail fin between inside the number nine. They also took his own logo, sort of the downhill ski racer, and put it on the side of the cockpit. They said, we'll take every little bit, bit of luck we can get. And Jack, we were here, you saw the shot of Kara, his wife, watching the restart, his father, Bob, a former racer himself, pacing back here. He turned and said, that was a champion's move. Well, he's going to have to wag the dog a little bit in this last few laps to get this job done, Paul. Scott Sharp was fifth. He came into the pit area and has climbed out of the car. We'll update you on that as well, but the battle is right here. First and second at the Indy 500. Three tenths of a second separating them last time across the line. And then it stretched out to eight tenths of a second. Still both very much in contact. 213 miles an hour. The last lap for Eddie Cheever. Well, they're very close. The key is who works good on a fuel full tank of fuel and who's got to set up when they're when they go empty towards the end of the lap. Both cars are fueled all the way to the end of the race, as is third place, Steve Knapp. Davey Hamilton is fourth, Robbie Unser is fifth, but they are one and two laps behind the lead, respectively. You might have saw Cheever coming off of turn four, using up the whole racetrack, very close to the outside wall, Paul. So Eddie's after it. He's chasing it hard. Oh, once again, he turns the lap at 213.1 miles an hour, compared to Buddy Lazier's 211.6.
13 laps to go. We mentioned Scott Sharp, Jack Aroot. Well, let's ask him, Paul, what put you out of it, Scott? Uh, suddenly on the restart, I went to shift up to second gear, and we had no gears. And all of a sudden, we had no gears, and I couldn't even go back to first or third or anything. Well, last year it was engines. This year it seems to be problems with the gearbox. It's interesting, Paul, the gearbox problems. Uh, there was really no clue that the gearbox were any kind of problem uh, leading up to the start of this race. And as we continue to watch this battle for the lead at Indianapolis, don't forget next on ABC Sports, the J.C. Penney LPGA Skins Game. Featuring holes worth $20,000, $30,000, and $40,000. But right now, it's the lead at the Indianapolis 500 that is in some dispute, though Buddy Legere has not been able to keep pace with Eddie Cheever. There is Greg Ray, early leader in this run, who once he began to suffer mechanical ills, fell further and further and further back. He's now 19 laps behind the leader in 18th position. 213.8, Eddie Cheever is driving to win the Indy 500, picks up the pace. The last segment, Paul. This is quick as we've seen him run all day, so Eddie has saved a little bit for the trouble. This will bring the yellow out. That's Marco Greco from that, Brazil. That, is, that looks like a motor problem, but now we're going to have the yellow. We're going to pack it up. We're going to have one more restart to see who wins this 500 mile race. There is exactly the kind of situation that we suggested can change so drastically the final lap of the Indianapolis 500. We'll be back right after this. Ready to go green once again. The pace car has already begun to accelerate. The mind game begins between Eddie Cheever and Buddy Lazier. This could be the key to the race right here. They both look surge at, a little look bit. Look at them surging. They're trying to get him to brake check. Uh, this is a famous Bobby Unser move, actually. Get him to brake check. The old head fake and go on the basketball court. Oh, the game is very definitely underway, and we're ready to put the race in play at the Indianapolis 500. Looking for the green. Look at Cheever. He sweeps way down to the inside. What a move to try and keep Buddy Lazier off of his back. Six to go. Well, he's actually trying to break the draft there, and I think he got the job done. I think once Eddie gets onto the back straightaway, that it's going to be very difficult for Buddy to hang on. Eddie Cheever, the well-spoken thinking man's race driver. Not to detract anything from Buddy Lazier. So now we count down laps to the end of the Indianapolis 500. And the battle is quite simply these two men. for this Indy 500. 
Owen, who has a lot of history out of Albuquerque with the under. Two to go at Indianapolis. Cheever pulls away last lap at 212 miles an hour. The lap before that at 213. here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Today, he helps Eddie Cheever. And how about those people from Wrinkled Potato Chips who got on board as a sponsor on an otherwise unsponsored car just a week and a half ago? They may be the happiest of all. They sure might. Eddie says uh, sponsors have got to be an extension to the team, and he's done a great job for him today. Robbie Unzer, the second highest place rookie, finishes in fifth place. He is, of course, the team car to Eddie Cheever. Cheever, Lazier, Knapp, Hamilton, Robbie Unzer. Those are the top five at Indianapolis. Fun to see the other teams out there giving the congratulations as he's coming down pit road. Well, they, the peers, probably know better than anyone else what it takes to get to Indy and, moreover, what it takes to win at Indy. And they appreciate the accomplishment here today. And the Unzer jinx, by the way, is broken on the 24th of May. Into victory lane for Eddie Cheever. And here with the Pet Boys winner's circle is Jack Aroot. Well, Eddie Cheever has toiled first in Formula 3000, then in Formula One, and then in kart, and now in the Pet Boys Indy Racing League. But he also once said that it was a living, breathing organism they called the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He gets the congratulations. The official Borg Warner Trophy is being positioned on his rear wing. Triumphant as he is, Eddie Cheever, now calling Tampa, Florida his home, has come to victory lane. They say that Indy is a place that makes American heroes. And Eddie Cheever, you are the winner of the 82nd Indianapolis 500. Congratulations. Heck, I, have, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. He gets the congratulations of Owen Snyder. Snyder's been here before with Al Unser Jr. Eddie, let's go back to the start of the race. There was an altercation with J.J. Yaley, and we seem to think that maybe you were involved in it as well. Was it a close call? I turned into one at the start of the race, and somebody bumped me from behind. The car went sideways, and I thought, oh, I don't want to end this way. And uh, I had about 15 guardian angels on me today. I had five or six close calls, but... Uh, 
I squeezed through all of them. Let's talk about near the end of the race. It looked like you were going to do a wall wang up there. It was reminiscent coming out of a corner of your qualifying run. How close was it? I wasn't going to finish second. Second was not in the books today. Either going to win or not finish at all. Well, they say the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is a place for heroes, American heroes. And now the emblematic sip of the all-American drink. Eddie Cheever, when you started your driving career, what did Indy mean to you? My father told me I was raised in Italy. And my father told me that uh, if you're going to win one race in your world, in the life, win the Indy 500. This one's for my dad. Oh. Eddie Cheever led six times for 76 laps to become the next American hero. Unofficial results of the 82nd running of the Indy 500 with Steve Knapp as the highest place rookie in the field. Buddy Lazier just couldn't pedal fast enough to catch Eddie Cheever at the end of the race. The fastest rookie, Jimmy Kite, up at 11, followed by the senior rookie, Jack Hewitt. So the Indianapolis 500-mile race has now been run. We hope that Jim Guthrie is out of surgery and doing well. We'll be back after this. With 23 lead changes among 10 drivers in the 500 miles, Eddie Cheever was hit in the very first turn, had the car sideways, but he persevered, and he took the 82nd running of the Indianapolis 500. Congratulations to Eddie Cheever of Tampa, Florida. Now let's send you back to Brent Musburger in New York. Well, thank you very much. Good job out there at Indy. Eddie Cheever, his best previous finish fourth back in 1992.